This talk is part of a series of lectures on modular forms and will be about theta functions. So um, just as background, we found some examples of modular forms. We found the Eisenstein series um, um, E4, E6 and so on, which were modular forms of weight 4, 6 and so on. And there was also an Eisenstein series E2, which was not quite a modular form, but if you fiddle around with it a bit, we found there was a mod it, it gave rise to a modular form delta the discriminant of weight 12, which was Q times product of 1 minus Q to the n to the 24. Um, so um, theta functions are another way of producing modular forms, which don't um, involve Eisenstein series. So let's give the simplest example of a theta function. This would be the theta function of tau, which is just sum over all integers n of e to the pi i n squared tau, where as usual tau is in the upper half plane. I should say the, the, the notation for theta functions is really a bit of a mess and there are several other related functions also called theta functions. You will often find the following function theta tau and of tau and z which is sum of e to the pi i n squared um, tau plus 2n z. Um, and you can see that the theta function we're looking at is the special case when z equals zero. So, so the special case z equals zero is sometimes called um, theta constants. Um, they're also sometimes called theta null verta, which is German for theta null values or something like that. And when z equals naught, the, the, these will turn out to be modular forms in tau. You can also fix theta, sorry, fi fi fix tau, and consider theta as a function of z. And then these are almost periodic in z. Well, they're, they're, they are periodic. They're, I should say they're almost double periodic. In, in other words, they're almost elliptic functions, but they're not quite elliptic functions because they, if, if you add tau to z, it's, it's, it's not quite invariant. Um, finally, you can consider theta as a function of both tau and z, and these are then called Jacobi forms. So um, what we're going to be doing is, is just looking at the special case when we're, we're forgetting about z and just taking it to be constant. Um, and the notation for theta functions is sort of a real mess. You find all sorts of things like theta 1, 1 and theta 1, 0 and so on in the literature. And it's a nightmare trying to keep track of which is which. Um, so now let's look at the equations this theta function satisfies. So we recall theta of tau is sum over n of e to the pi i n squared tau. And you notice it's obviously invariant under tau goes to tau plus 2. So this is not quite invariant under tau goes to tau plus 1. So it's not going to be invariant under the whole of SL2z. Um, so this is the trivial functional equation. It also has a much more interesting one which says theta of minus 1 over tau is equal to root tau over i times theta tau. So this um, is what you would expect from modular form of weight one half, except we've got some funny roots of unity um, lying around somewhere. Um, so this is actually quite easy to prove. What we do is we first recall the Poisson summation formula. This says that if you sum um, some function over the integers, it's equal to the sum over the integers of its Fourier transform. So here f is some sort of nice function and it doesn't really matter exactly what we mean by nice because the functions we're going to use are so nice that um, if, they, if they didn't count as nice there'd be something wrong with your definition of nice. So this just sort of, you, you want something about all its derivatives should be rapidly decreasing or something like that but who really cares. And here we have the Fourier transform of f is defined by f hat of y is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the 2 pi i 
xy times f of x dx. Um, if you go to look at books on Fourier transforms written by analysts and physicists, they get very confused about this factor of pi um, and put it in all sorts of weird places. You will sometimes see, um, you know, you get the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over root 2 pi of something. And sometimes they put a 1 over 2 pi in front of the integral, but then the inverse Fourier transform, you have to miss the 2 pi out about it. So they get very confused. Uh, the correct place to put the 2 pi is in the exponent here, and then everything just works out very nicely. Um, so um, what we do is we just take f of x is equal to e to the pi x squared i tau, and then its Fourier transform um, should be root tau over i of e to the pi y squared over i tau. And if you stick this into the Poisson summation formula, you just immediately get the transformation formula for the theta function. Um, in order to show this, you use the well-known fact that integral minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus pi x squared dx is just equal to 1, which is a standard exercise in complex analysis or Fourier analysis or whatever. So um, we've got a functional equation for the theta function, but there's a little bit of a problem because it doesn't quite seem to be a modular form because, you know, we've, we've got theta of tau plus 2 equals theta tau and theta of minus 1 over tau is root tau over i times theta of tau. And the problem is this corresponds to the matrix 1, 1, 2, 0 and this corresponds to the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0. And the trouble is these do not generate SL2 of z. Um, however, they come pretty close to generating it. So first of all, if, if, you, um, if you take these two matrices, well, if you conjugate the first by the second, you get the matrix 1, 1, 2, 0. And the matrices 1, 0, 2, sorry, uh, 1, 0, 2, 1. And if you take the matrices 1, 0, 2, 1 and 1, 2, 0, 1, then these generate a group called gamma of 2, which is the set of matrices A, B, C, D that are congruent to, to 1, 0, 0, 1 mod 2. So gamma over gamma of 2 is just isomorphic to SL2 of 2 by 2 matrices over the field with two elements, which just does order 6. So it's not too far away from SL2z. Um, so, so to show these two matrices, 1, 0, 2, 1, and 1, 2, 0, 1, generate gamma of 2 is not terribly difficult. Um, you can sort of do row and column operations where you can add an, or subtract an even multiple of any row or column to any other row or column. And by using the, these operations, you can easily show that anything in gamma 2 can be reduced to the identity matrix. Um, so what we take, um, if we take gamma 2 and then take the union of gamma 2 together with this matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0, this is a group of index 3 in gamma, in, um, sorry, not in gamma 2, in, in SL2 of Z. Um, so you could think of it as being a, a, a sort of theta group. So theta is not quite a modular form for the whole of SL2, but it's a modular form for the a subgroup of index 3. Um, you notice the transformation relating theta of minus 1 over tau and theta tau as a factor of root tau over i, which isn't quite root tau, um, but has, a, has an extra eighth root of unity in it because there's a sort of square root of i lying around. But that doesn't really matter. It's, it's a sort of modular form where you stick in a root of unity, and that's really just as good as a modular form. Um, so, so what can you do with this theta function? Well, um, what I'm going to do is to show how to use it to get the functional equation for the Riemann zeta function. So um, if we put zeta star of s to be gamma of s over 2 times pi to the minus s over 2 times zeta of s, where zeta is the usual Riemann zeta function, 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s and so on, then the functional equation says that zeta star of s is equal to zeta star of 1 minus s. So this is 
Riemann's um, form of the functional equation. Um, Riemann wasn't actually the first to find the functional equation of the Riemann zeta function, but he, he, he found a very neat proof of it. And Riemann found this very nice proof of it. You can just derive it from the functional equation of the theta function. And you do it by writing down the following. Um, you write down the half the integral from zero, zero to infinity of theta i x times x to the s over 2 minus 1 dx. And there's a big problem with this integral in that it does not converge. for any value of s. However, I'm going to ignore this for the moment and pretend it does converge So, as, and, and um, show how to get the functional equation of the Riemann zeta function out of it. And then we will go back and fix the fact that it doesn't converge. So, so for the moment, we're going to ignore convergence problems. And what you notice first is that this integral, if it did converge, would be equal to zeta star of s. And this follows easily from the fact the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus n squared pi x times x to the s over 2 minus 1 dx. Um, this is more or less the usual integral for the gamma function with a change of variable. And it turns out to be equal to gamma of s over 2 times pi to the minus s over 2 times n to the minus s, at least if n is not equal to zero. The term for n equals zero in the sum for the theta function gives a few problems, but as I said, we're ignoring convergence problems for the moment. So since, since theta of um, um, i x is equal to sum of e to the minus n squared pi x, um, you can see that the integral of this theta function with respect to x to the s over 2 minus 1 is at least formally equal to zeta star of s. And now we've got the transformation formula for the theta function. Theta of tau is equal to root tau over i times theta of minus 1 over tau. And if you stick this functional equation into the formula for zeta star of s in terms of theta and do a simple change of variable, this easily gives you zeta star of 1 minus s equals zeta star of s. Well, now we have to deal with this problem. This integral doesn't actually converge, so this argument doesn't, strictly speaking, make any sense. So let's study convergence of the, the, this integral. So the integral from 0 to infinity of theta of um, ix times x to the s over 2 minus 1 dx. And there are two problems. First of all, when x is approximately zero, it might not converge. And when x is approximately infinity, it might not converge. <coughs> so let's study these. First of all, suppose x is approximately infinity, so it's very large. Then theta of i x is approximately 1 plus something very, very small. So small that it causes no convergence problems whatsoever. So what we're doing is looking at an integral that looks like the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 times x to the s over 2 minus 1 dx. And this converges for the real part of s less than 0. And, um, and we can also work out what it converges to. Um, it converges to um, minus 2, 2 over s. And we notice this can be continued to all s that are not zero, just by analytic continuation. And similarly, for x approximately zero, the functional equation of theta shows that theta of i x is going to be approximately x to the minus a half plus something very, very small. So the, the integral near zero of x to the minus a half times x to the s over 2 minus 1 dx is going to converge for the real part of s greater than, z greater than 1. And it converges um, to something that looks like 2 over s minus 1. And again, you can continue this to all s, at least for all s that are not equal to 1. So 
we see that it converges near infinity if real part of s is less than zero, and converges near zero if the real part of s is greater than one, and since there are no complex values of s that are real part less than zero and greater than one, this integral doesn't actually converge anywhere at all, and um, um, we, we have to regularize it. Well, it's quite easy to regularize. What we do is we is near zero, we just sort of chop off the bit of the theta function that's equal to one, and just use the fact that the and, and just do the analytic continuation of the integral of x to the s over two minus one um, near s equals zero, and, and we do this sorry near s equals infinity, and we do the same thing near sorry. Uh, we do the same thing near x equals zero. We just chop off the x to the minus a half from theta of i x and deal with it separately. Um, notice that this is a sort of regularization you can do with any integral. If we have the integral of x to the s minus one times f of x dx, um, suppose that near zero f has an asymptotic expansion, so f of x is approximately sum over, say, a lambda. Um, x to the minus lambda, and suppose that near infinity f of x has an asymptotic expansion of say sum of b mu x to the minus mu. Then we can do the same thing, um, we can regularize the integral by just um, um, chopping off the x to the minus lambdas that cause f to converge to diverge near zero and sort of dealing with them separately. And for, for each factor of a lambda x to the minus lambda, we sort of get something with a pole um, at x equal at sorry s equals lambda or s equals mu. And this is exactly what happens with the Riemann zeta function. The theta function we're integrating has an asymptotic expansion at zero and infinity, a, a particularly simple one because it, uh, there's only one term in the asymptotic expansion. So what this means is that zeta star of s actually ends up with two poles at s equals zero and s equals one. And these two poles come from the fact that theta of um, i x is approximately equal to one at um, x near infinity, and I think that gives you the pole at s equals zero, and theta of i x is approximately x to the minus a half at x when x is about zero, and that's, that gives you a pole at s equals one. So, um, so the, 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 the formula, the, the, the derivation of the functional equation from, of zeta from the theta function works just fine, except that you have to remember to regularize the integral by chopping off the bad bits and dealing with them separately. Um, so that's done theta function of a one-dimensional lattice. So Next lecture, we're going to be looking at theta functions of high dimensional lattices, which will actually give us examples of theta functions that are modular forms for the whole of SL2Z and not for this funny index 3 subgroup.